so we'll go through them later on. So, Roxana, it's over to you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining um, this webinar, which is being sponsored by Langley Wellington um, Solicitors. Um, if I... Right. I put together a little agenda about what, how um, this webinar is going to work. I'm going to have an introduction. Um, there will be some information about um, us as speakers, and then we'll do the presentation, um, an introduction for parents to SEN reform and EHC plans, and then there'll be a question and answer session at the end, as Aaron's already explained to you. But obviously, you can let him have um, your questions, and he will back them for you. Right. Uh, moving on to the next slide, which right. Uh, there's a picture of me. Um, I'm a senior solicitor here at Langley Wellington, and I will hopefully be joined by a colleague, Deborah Hay, who is a barrister who specialises in education law as well. You can see my telephone number and my email address. Um, if you don't get a chance to ask a question today, or you think of something later on, then please feel free to email that um, question to me or any query that you may have. Right, a little bit about education lawyers. Uh, we are a dedicated team within uh, a firm in Gloucestershire and we are very highly experienced and skilled in providing legal advice um, in education issues and in particular special educational needs. Um, as a department, we are quite small, but we have over 20 years of experience of providing legal advice to families throughout England and Wales. Uh, we're a national practice, in case you're all thinking, well, we're based in Gloucester. We actually get um, help clients um, throughout the country. Um, children and their families um, are helped by us um, in England and Wales, really. Um, we only deal with cases in the high specialist area of law. So you can be confident that we've got a lot of knowledge and of the law and the ex and experience behind it. Um, uh, we are a recognised firm in what's called the Ch Chambers and Partners Legal Directory, um, which basically uh, rank and rate for firms across the country um, through information provided by um, clients and other people that work with you. And we've rec been recognised in Chambers and Partners for a number of years. And there you'll see quotes that have been put in the um, directory, um, some of whom have come from clients directly. Um, we work with parents who are concerned about their children's education and who feel that their local authority is not providing adequate support to address their special educational needs. Uh, we help with the legal process and the paperwork. Um, which means that the parent or carer can then concentrate on the child and look forward to seeing real results. Um, they ask us for help when they have a problem. Parents ask us for help when they have a problem with the local authority, um, and we try and make a real difference to our clients' lives and get the children the education and support that they are entitled to. Uh, a little bit of information about myself. I've qualified in 1997. I've specialised in educational negligence cases. And um, now I particularly focus on special educational needs and appeals to the SEND Tribunal, which is the Special Educational Needs Tribunal. Um, I can help you obtain or challenge a statement. Um, and I've also advised on admissions and exclusions and disability discrimination cases. Like most solicitors, I've come into this area of law because of my own personal experience. I've got um, two brothers and a sister who have severe learning and physical disabilities. And growing up with them, I can understand the, you know, the parents' desire to ensure that their education the child received is appropriate and meets their particular need. Miss Hay, who will join me hopefully shortly, is a very experienced barrister. Um, and she speaks and lectures on at many conferences and seminars in this field. She's also highly recommended and recognised by Chambers and Partners and Legal 500 as well. She can um, help with all aspects of special educational needs, including post-16 and post-19 work. And she does look at other areas of education law as well. Now, on to, um, before I go on to the actual presentation, um, I would like to say that um, Langley Wellington are an organisational member of EVA, 
and we will also be attending the conference on the 6th of June um, and having a stand in there and if there's anybody who is attending like to ask us for specific advice or any questions about um, special educational needs they're more than welcome to come and join us and we will try our best to help you. Right, on to the presentation. Well, it's been a long journey actually, um, and the changes have come about as a result of a green paper, a new approach to special education needs and disability, which set out a vision to replace the existing system with a new one. Its aims are to, to bring together the services children with special educational needs and disabilities into a single assessment and a single plan covering education, health and care. It was trying to, it's going to try and make the system less stressful for families, give parents more information about services and expertise available locally, and hopefully give parents more control. Where are we now? Well, the 1st of September 2014, the new system will come into effect when Part 3 of the Children and Families Act 2014 comes into force. In addition to the Act, there will be new regulations, a new code of practice. The regulations and code of practice remain in a draft form at the moment. A consultation process on the original draft code of practice received over 700 responses, highlighting substantial concerns about its content. Uh, a revised draft code of practice was published in 2014, and the consultation uh, was very short, and it closed on the 6th of May 2014. And it's clear from reading the code of practice that there are some issues that still need ironing out. Um, and the regulation and the code of practice are not expected to be published in final form until a little later, summer 2014. That is the current indication at the moment, and it could change um, depending on how much um, response the government has received to the consultation. What is the new SEN system? Well, one of the big changes is that the local authority um, will need to publish a local offer setting out in one accessible place information about the provision they expect to be available across education, health and social care for children and young people between the ages of 0 and 25 years in, the areas, in, the, in their area who have a special educational needs or disability. Local education, health and care organisation must make joint commissioning arrangements about the, about the education, health and care provision to be secured for children and young people with SEN or disabilities in their area. This will include making arrangements in general terms for considering and agreeing what provision is reasonably required in the area, the provision which is to be secured and by whom, and the procedures for resolving disputes between the organisations. Statements of special educational needs will be replaced by an education, health and care plan. There will be education, health and care needs assessments, which will replace the current statutory assessment. The government um, is aiming, aim in terms of the assessment, is to make it more joined up and what they're calling a tell us once approach for children and young people, rather than finding that social care comes to parents in at one point and then education comes at another point. They want it all to be joined up so that you have to only tell the information to the, um, to the local authority uh, at one time. The timetable for an LA to undertake an, um, an EHC needs assessment and issue a final EHC plan will be reduced to 20 weeks. Currently we work to a timetable of 26 weeks, so it's been um, reduced by six weeks and if a plan can be if the assessment and plan can be completed in a shorter time then it is recommended that the local authorities try and do this. An EHC plan can be maintained for a young person up to the age of 25 if they remain in education or training and a plan is necessary for them. An EHC plan could therefore for the first time be maintained for 
to young people transferring into further education or more moving into training if it remains necessary for the young person to continue to have an EHC plan. Young people over compulsory school age, i.e. at the end of the academic year in which they turn 16, have given an increased profile. This includes the transfer of the right of appeal to the SEND tribunal from the parent to the young people over compulsory school age. And one of the issues here will be capacity and whether or not a young person has the capacity to make decisions for themselves. And that still needs to be ironed out um, and clarified in the code of practice. When an EHBC plan is made or reviewed, uh, parents and young people can request and obtain a personal budget. Now, this personal budget will be an amount of money identified by the local authority to deliver specific provisions set out in an EHC plan. It can include funding for special educational needs, special educational health and social care provision, and where an LA agrees that this could involve direct payments being made to the parent or young person to purchase identified provision themselves. It is important to note, however, that an LA does not have to agree to provide direct payments. So although there will be a personal budget, it can refuse to provide direct payments. Um, that means the money being handed over to the parents or the young person. If a direct payment is made, the funding must be set at a level that it will secure the specific provision that has been, has been identified for the young person in the EHC plan. An outline of the new process. The majority of children with SEN, um, most will continue to have their needs met in the mainstream schools and colleges from the resources ordinarily available in mainstream settings. Where it's decided that a school pupil doesn't, does have SEN, the decision should be recorded in the school records and the pupil's parents must be formally identified. Arrangements for appropriate support should then be made and reviewed in line with an agreed date. And the approach that is now being advocated for schools is an assess, plan, do, review approach. And where a pupil continues to make less than expected progress, the school should consider involving specialists, including those from outside, such as an educational psychologist. Where, despite um, the school having put in a relevant and purposeful action, the child or young person has not made expected progress, an EHC needs assessment should be requested by parents and or, or the school. It's important to remember that it is the parents and the young person have a right to request the EHC needs assessments and they don't need to wait for the school to um, request this on their behalf, they can do so themselves. The legal threshold for a formal assessment of a child or young person's needs remains fundamentally the same. If the LA is of the opinion that a child or young person has or may have special educational needs and it may be necessary for special educational provision to be made in accordance with an EHC plan, it should undertake an EHC needs assessment. In practice, that means that if a child or young person needs cannot be appropriately met within the resources ordinarily available in a mainstream school or post-16 placement, an EHC needs assessment should be carried out. Sorry, Aaron, it's not moving forward. <laughs> right. The um, EHC assessment timetable, so week one, um, parent or school requests an EHC needs assessment, and by week six, the LA must make a decision whether or not to undertake that EHC needs assessment. So during that period, they'll gather the information from the parent and school and use that to decide whether or not they need to go on a and make an assessment of the child's need. By week 16, the LA must notify the parent or young person if it decides not to issue an EHC plan. Now, both at week 6 and week 16, 
if those actions take place, for instance, if they decide not to undertake an EHC needs assessment, the local authority must also not notify the parent and the young person of their right to appeal to the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal. Similarly, if they don't issue an EHC plan, the local authority must notify the parent and young person of their right to um, appeal to the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal. Now, obviously, if they're issuing um, a EHC plan, then this must happen between week 16 and week 20. Um, and the LA must issue a final EHC plan, having first given parents and young person at least 15 calendar days to consider and comment upon a draft or version. The issue of an EHC plan. The legal threshold of the issue of an EHC plan is the same as it currently um, is for a statement. An EHC plan must be issued if, in the light of the EHC needs assessment, it is necessary for special educational provision to be made for a child or young person in accordance with such a plan. The Code of Practice, um, the Draft Code of Practice, sets out various considerations for an LA to take into account when reaching such a decision. But if the child or young person's needs cannot be met within the resources ordinarily available in the mainstream setting, an EHC plan should be issued. The content of an EHC plan, well this has been um, a big discussion point. Um, the government has decided not to require LAs to use a single national template for EHC plans. There has been one in place for statements, but um, it certainly um, hasn't set such requirements for um, an EHC plan. Although in the current draft um, code of practice, it has set out a bit more information uh, in terms of highlighting the various sections um, which need to be in an EHC plan using the letters shown below. Now, Section A um, is added uh, views, interests and aspirations of the child and their parent or the young person. Now, in this section, um, it needs to, it can include details about the aspirations and what the child wants to achieve. Um, it can look for aspirations as far as paid employment, independent living and community participation. It can include details about play, health, schooling, independence, friendship, further education, and future plans, including employment, where practical. It also needs to include information about how to communicate with the child or young person and engage them in the decision-making process. The child's history um, needs to be included. And when a young person is quoted, it has to make sure that um, that is clearly marked in this section so that people are aware that that is the view of the parent or professional or um, it is the young person themselves that are speaking. Now, in terms of section B, this is where the child uh, or young person's special educational needs will be set out. And all of the, child, all of the child's um, identified special education needs must be specified. Um, SEN may include those requiring health and social care provision where such provision is for a child or young person's education or training. So if the health and social care provision is required for the child's education or training, it should be included there as well. In terms of section C, um, this looks at the young person's or the child's health needs, which are related to their SEN, and must be identified throughout the EHC needs assessment, which relate to the young person. Some health care needs, such as routine dental um, health needs, are unlikely to be put into this section. The clinical commissioning group may also choose to specify other health care needs which are not related to the young person's SEN, in relation, for instance, in relation to a long-term condition which might need management in a special educational needs setting. 
Section D is the child or young person's social care needs, which are related to the special educational needs uh, and have been identified through the needs assessment um, and which require provision for a child or young person under 18 and the Section 2 of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. Now, the local authority may also choose to specify other social care needs here which are not linked to the child's um, special educational needs. And this could include reference to child protection or if the child is in need. But this information is only included with the consent of the child or their parents. Section E. Well, here a range of outcomes over varying timescales need to be included, and they cover education, health and care as appropriate, but recognising that it is the education and training outcomes only that will help determine when the plan is ceased. A clear distinction between outcomes and provision, the provision should help the child achieve an outcome. It is not an outcome in itself. So the provision is not an outcome itself, it is what will be required in order for the child to um, achieve its outcome. It should set out what steps need to be taken to meet the outcomes and also set out the arrangements for monitoring progress including review and transition, transition review arrangements. Transition review means when a child is going from a certain phase in their education into another for instance, from primary to secondary school or from secondary to post-16 education. And also there should be arrangements for setting out and monitoring short-term targets as well. Now, it also should look ahead um, and plan for key changes in the young person's life, such as changing a school, moving from children to adult care as well, or from moving from uh, further education into adulthood. Section F is the provision that will be required and the provision must be detailed and specific and should be quantified. For example, it should say um, the type of provision required, the hours it is required for and the frequency of support and level of expertise including where this support is secured through a personal budget. Provision must be specified for each and every need specified in Section B, and it must be clear how the provision will support the outcomes. Where health or social care provision educates or trains a child, it must appear in this section. There should be clarity as to how advice and information gathered has informed the provision specified. Where the local authority has departed from that advice, they should say so and give reasons for it. Flexibility may be required in some cases to meet the changing needs of the child or young person, including flexibility in terms of the use of the personal budget. Now, Section G is where any health provision reasonably required by the learning difficulties or disabilities which result in the child or young person having SEN need to be included. And this must be detailed and specific and should be quantified, for, in ter for example, um, in terms of the type of support and who will provide it. It must be clear how the provision will support the outcomes, including the health needs to be met and the outcomes to be achieved through provision secured through a personal health budget. Now, health care provision reasonably required may also include specialist support and therapies such as medical treatments and delivery of medication, occupational therapy and physiotherapy, nursing support such as um, and nursing support, sorry, and um, things such as wheelchairs and continent supplies. It can include highly specialist services needed by only a small number of children. Section H1 is any social care provision which must be made for a child or young person under 18 resulting from the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1980. 
And again, this must be clear how the provision will support the outcomes, including um, any provisions secured through a personal budget. There should be clarity as to how advice and information gathered has informed the provision specified. Now, this section must specify all services assessed as being needed for a disabled child or young person. And this brings in this Thomas wants and including it into one plan. Um, so it can include things like um, practical assistance at home, uh, assistance in traveling to facilities, adaptations at home, um, provision of meals at home or elsewhere. Um, so there's quite a number of things that are covered under the um, Chronically Disabled, uh, Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. In terms of Section 2, here they will list any other social care provision reasonably required by the learning um, difficulties or disabilities which result in the child having um, special educational needs. Now this will include things like residential short breaks and services provided to children uh, arising from their SEN but unrelated to a disability. Um, this should include any provision to go through a social care direct payment. Now, section I, this will be where the name and or type of placement to be attended by the child or young person, i.e. the type of school or the name of the school will be put. And these details must be included only in the final EHC plan and not any draft that is sent to a parent or a young person. Um, by type of placement, it means, uh, for instance, a special school for children with specific learning difficulties and other associated difficulties. And that can then state what difficulties are. And this normally happens when a school has not been identified for um, a child or a young person. Now, Section J is where there is a personal budget, um, the details of how it will support outcomes, the provision it will be used for, and the arrangements for any direct payments will be set out. And in Section K will be the advice and information gathered during the HC needs assessment, um, as well as um, appendices, um, i.e. the documents that were considered um, during the needs assessment and relied upon um, to draft the EHC plan. Right, um, what if you disagree with the local authority? The um, Special Educational Needs Tribunal um, has been there for some time and it hears the appeals against decisions made by the local authority in relation to children and young people's EHC needs assessments and the EHC plan. Now, the tribunal can dismiss an appeal, order the local authority to carry out an uh, assessment, an EHC needs assessment, to make and maintain an EHC plan or to maintain the, an EHC plan with amendments. It can also order the LA to reconsider or correct an EHC plan. But basically, the rights of appeal are still there, which are existing under the current um, system. Parents or young people are required to provide sufficient grounds of appeal setting out their case and will need, to, will need robust, comprehensive and up-to-date evidence to support their position. Now, this can be evidence from um, the... Um, national health, um, for instance, a uh, speech and language therapist or not occupational therapist employed by the NHS, or it can be independent evidence which has been obtained by parents, um, which is up to date um, and not um, more than six months old, really. Appeals are usually listed for hearing within 20 weeks following registration of the appeal and are in main heard by a panel of three, a tribunal judge and two specialist lay members. The tribunal will consider written and oral evidence submitted by both the parties to the appeal and then make a decision. The tribunal can draw on its own ex expertise when reaching a decision and should issue a written decision within two weeks of the appeal being heard. So you don't get a decision on the day, you get it within two weeks of the appeal being heard. 
Now, parents or a young person over compulsory school age have a statutory right to appeal to the Special Education Needs Disability Tribunal about a decision not to undertake an EHC needs assessment or a reassessment, a decision not to issue an EHC plan, and they can also appeal against description of a child or young person's special education needs specified in the plan. The special um, educational provision specified, the name or type of school institution specified, or if no placement has been specified in the plan. An amendment to the above mentioned parts of the EHC plan, a decision not to amend an EHC plan following a review or reassessment or if the um, local authority decides to cease to maintain an EHC plan, then uh, you can appeal against the decision. And whilst the appeal is ongoing, the plan will remain in force. Now, the tribunals will not hear appeals about personal budgets, but will hear appeals about special educational needs uh, sorry, per special education provision to which a personal budget may apply. It's important to remember that the tribunal cannot hear appeals about the health or social care provision set out in an EHC plan. It will only continue to hear appeals concerning the special educational needs and the special educational provision and education placement specified in the EHC plan. An important change to note is that whilst the current two-month deadline to lodge an appeal from the date of an appealable decision is set, sent in writing to the um, parents by the LA will remain, for the majority of cases a further step will first be required, namely the parent or young person will need to consider mediation. Now, mediation. This is a, um, it has been there, but it's set out in more detail in the new um, draft code of practice. Where a parent or young person wishes to appeal against a decision made by an LA or the contents of a plan, they may only do so if a mediation advisor has issued a mediation certificate. Now, the only exception the above is where the appeal only concerns the school placement named in the plan, the type of school placement named in the plan, but the fact that the plan doesn't name a school or placement. So in relation to the um, actual special education needs and the provision, mediation will need to be considered. In all other cases, the parents or young person first need to contact a mediation advisor and the LA will give the de give, provide the details to the parent or young person within the two months appeal deadline. This contact will usually be by telephone. When contacted by a parent or young person, the mediation advisor must provide information on mediation, answer any questions the parent or young person may have. The mediation must not seek to put pressure on the parent or young person to go into mediation. The decision is up to the parent or young person and so they can decide not to pursue this. When they decide not to pursue the mediation following contact with a mediation advisor, the advisor will then issue a certificate within three working days of the parent or young person informing them that they don't want to pursue mediation. And this could be based on a decision that you've tried to, meet, um, I suppose, sit down and speak to the local authority and it hasn't worked, therefore if this process will only delay it, then um, you can decide not to pursue it. The certificate will then need to be lodged um, with the appeal uh, with the same tribunal. If a parent or young person decides to pursue mediation after having spoken to a mediation advisor, the LA must ensure that the mediation session takes place within 30 calendar days and it must be conducted by an independent mediator and not someone within the local authority. Once mediation is completed, the mediation advisor must issue a certificate within three working days confirming that the mediation has been concluded. And then if the parent or young person still wants to lodge an appeal the uh, with the tribunal, they can. 
The mediation will not prejudice the tribunal appeal. The tribunal will reach its own independent findings and conclusion and will disregard any offers or comments made during mediation. Regardless of whether or not mediation is pursued, an appeal must be lodged within one month of receiving the mediation certificate or two months of the original decision being sent by the local authority to the parent or young person, whichever is the later. Otherwise, um, the um, opportunity to appeal will be lost um, and there's no a way to get that right back um, at that point. Mediation and disagreement resolution relating to health and care provision. Whilst a person um, cannot appeal to the SEND tribunal about health or care provision specified in the plan, where uh, a plan has been issued and finalised, they can ask for mediation to cover any or all three aspects of the plan. So that's the health, health, education, health and care. Where this applies, mediation should cover all aspects of their concerns about the plan. Now, in addition to mediation, the a local authority must make disagreement resolution services available to parents and young person, commissioned by but independent to the local authority. They should be available to cover all children and young people with special educational needs, whether they have a plan or not, and they should be available to help resolve disagreements about any educational health and care disagreements. It should be noted that the Special Education Needs Tribunal is frequently an effective, an effective and successful forum for parents and is likely to remain the most efficient form of recourse for parents seeking to challenge a decision by the local authority in relation to the assessment of provision for or placement for children and young people with special educational needs. What if my child already has a statement or a learning disability assessment? Um, any child or young person who is currently the subject of a statement or a learning disability assessment will qualify for an EHC plan unless their special provision needs have changed and they no longer require the level of provision. The regulations dealing with the transfer of statements and learning disability assessments to plans have yet to be published in final form, but the government has stated in formal guidance that no child or young person should lose their statement or learning disability assessment and not have it replaced with the plan simply because the system is changing. Now the government is aiming for all learning disability assessments to be transferred to a plan by September 26 and all um, statements to be transferred by April 28. So if for instance, um, uh, the, not for, if for instance, basically the statement will hopefully transfer to a plan at following the next annual review of the statement. Right, some po points to basically note about these changes. There are clearly significant, um, clear and significant advantage to the new system, um, including the added protection for young people up to the age of 25. It was up to 19 before. Um, and a more joined up TALIS once approach and potentially greater flexibility in the delivery of provision. Now, when an LDA assessment was undertaken for a young person from the uh, age of 19 or 16 above. Um, there was um, no right of appeal, and obviously if they've got a plan, um, they now will have a right to appeal to the tribunal. Parents and young people do need to be made aware of the following. Um, despite their names, an EHC needs assessment and EHC plan are only triggered by a child or young person's special educational needs. To a considerable extent, the care element of a plan reflects the duties of the local authority under existing legislation and can already be included as non-educational provision in an existing statement. The health provision um, specified in the plan must be delivered, but the provision included in the plan in the first instance uh, will be a matter for the relevant clinical commissioning group and cannot uh, be the subject of appeal to the SEND tribunal. 
health provision can only be included as a non-educational provision in an existing statement. The Special Education Needs Tribunal will consider, continue to only consider the special education needs and the special educational provision and education placements required for children and young people and the assessment of special educational needs. There will be no right to appeal to the tribunal against health and care provision. And that is very important to note. Given the above, in many ways, the, um, the new plan could be said to be a very similar document to the existing statement. The importance of ensuring that any provision which trains or educates a child or young person is recognised and specified in Section F of an EHC plan as special educational provision rather than health or care provision remains paramount if child, children and young people's needs are to be protected and adequately met. Speech and language therapy and occupational therapy are often required to address ch um, a child's special educational needs and as such should be included in the special education provision and not as a health provision. This can happen even now, uh, but it's case law has been decided to say that these are special educational provision and not in health provision. The revised draft code of practice makes the specific mention of the fact that addressing speech and language impairment should normally be recorded as a special educational provision unless there are exceptional reasons for not doing so. Concerns about the new system include that the following really. Um, we've got a, a very long new code of practice which has gone up from 142 pages to 242 pages in length at the time of the most recent draft. And is it user friendly? I think most people are saying not. It's a bit muddled and confused. The other concern is the removal of the current uh, school-based levels of support of School Action and School Action Plus and how um, this assess, plan, do, review method works in schools and how long should this be implemented before an EHC needs assessment is instigated. Well, it's not clear about that. You could be constantly going around in this circle of assess, plan, do and review and there's no clarity around when um, there should be a trigger to go to um, an EHC assessment whereby if you had the um, school-based levels as they currently stand, the school action, school action plus, it did make it a bit, it was more clearer. The potentially unrealistic expectations parents may have about the new health and care elements of the EHC plan, um, that is another concern. Um, as explored above, in many ways it could be said that the EHC plan is just a new name for a statement of special educational needs and doesn't actually um, really take a um, any further forward in terms of health and care elements. Um, there's increased potential for confusion as to whether provision is being specified as special educational provision or not. One of the other things uh, of great concern is the vulnerability of young people with recognised special education needs and disability over compulsory school age who will have their own right to appeal to the SEND tribunal rather than their parents. The revised code goes some way to addressing this and recognising the ongoing importance of input and support from parents but confusion still remains. And this needs to be clarified and a clear a definition about capacity needs to be set out in the code of practice. And how will the system work in practice? The government's own recent surveys show that those LAs which have been trialling the new system are still experiencing significant challenges, establishing joint commissioning structures across education, health and care services, putting in place transparent process for offering personal budgets, and planning how to transfer statements and learning disability plans to e, um, EHC plans. So there's a lot to be worked out and of course um, confusion will, re will remain for some time whilst everybody um, gets to grip with the um, new code of practice. 
Right.